Okay. Today is Tuesday, October 12th. I want to thank everyone for joining us for the October uh, Zoom webinar, Red River Apreus Association General Meeting. Uh, it has been a uh, tumultuous season, to, to say the least, but this fall has been absolutely spectacular. Um, it, we have had a good chunk of, of warm weather. We've had some intermittent rain, you know, which I'm not going to complain about, but it would have been, have been really, really nice about seven weeks prior, but, you know, <laughs> beggars can't be choosers. Um, this is the kind of fall, this is a beekeeper's fall, because if there was issues, if there was mistakes, if there was procrastination, this is a soft fall. This is where the gravy covers the burnt chicken kind of fall, where um, your bees will have a little extra brooding time because the uh, temperatures were still well into the double digits most nights. There was a, an evening where it was 18 all the way through dawn. Um, and it's uh, it gets the bees packing away, if not nectar. I saw bees collecting pollen from all over through different sources too. Ornamental, um, like uh, protect the pollinator kind of blooms and um, those late fall garden flowers. You could just see them dusted in all sorts of colored pollen. And that kind of variety really helps them out as well. Uh, everyone had ample time to uh, monitor and check and treat mites and then treat again if necessary. And again, it, uh, it was a pretty blessed fall. Lots of time for planning. However, you kind of notice today is chilly and um, it, it's turned. It's like if you, um, right now, everything should be wrapping up with your program. I don't know if anyone is still feeding but there isn't a lot of time for bees to be converting that feed into um, sugar that is going to be uh, breaking, uh, drying down below 18%. Um, if they can't do that, excessive moisture can cause some fermentation. So feeding is kind of, um, should be off the menu, so to speak. Um, Moving your colonies while it's still warm to where you want to have them over the winter is a good plan to do it now. Wrapping, that's a little bit premature. Um, generally speaking, I mean, some of my hives, I don't wrap up until November, but it really depends on timetable. And especially if you're a larger operator where, you know, you've, you know, if you're wrapping hundreds and hundreds of colonies, you don't have the luxury of, uh, of, of waiting to the last minute. Wrapping when it's cold is okay. Wrapping when there's snow on the ground just really sucks. It just is, is awful. And there's a few uh, uh, basic uh, beekeeping, um, basic tasks that need to be done in the fall. One is mice. Really nice fall makes really big mouse populations. So you want to be making sure that you're your sheds, your, your, your interior, if you're wintering inside, that your space is baited. Um, all of your storage sheds outside are baited where you store your feed pails, where you're storing your comb. Um, make sure that you're storing your empty honey supers where it's moth and mouse proof. And um, make sure that you're not waiting too long to, to get that done. Uh, the mice can get voracious, and especially now that the, the, the fields are pretty gleaned, uh, they're going to be looking for nice warm spaces to go inside. Um, there is uh, a lot of questions I have been getting, have been uh, more so about um, uh, entrance reducers and mouse guards. Um, mouse guards are always a good thing. Um, entrance reducers, maybe a little soon, but I winter with entrance reducers. So it's that we're going to cover a little bit more uh, later on. But it is one of those um, falls where, you know, it's been nice, but the weather is definitely turning. And we really have to start thinking about wrapping things up um, for our outdoor chores to make sure that our bees get put to bed nice and safe. And you should know 
where your mites are at. Treatment options for high mite counts are um, pretty much well limited, getting into maybe oxalic acid, miticide strips, there's not enough time, um, is that's a 40 plus day cycle. Formic acid, I, in my opinion, the ambient temperatures are not gonna make it very effective. So oxalic acid becomes kind of the go-to. Um, one of the things uh, in a conversation or uh, Derek had mentioned with Riel is that we're getting reports of some pretty high mite counts um, trickling in here and there. Uh, so while Derek is with us, um, Derek, can I pass it over to you to um, maybe talk about that for a few minutes and what's going on out there with high mite counts? Yeah, sure. Um, and I guess this was more uh, passed on to me by Rael. I, I was, I've been working with pretty closely with Rael the last two or three weeks or so. Uh, and yeah, he's been mentioning to me that up until last week, he's been getting quite a number of calls with uh, beekeepers with substantially high mite levels uh, still. Uh, and whether these beekeepers were caught off guard or, or what, happened there or maybe they weren't monitoring properly or, or what was going on but he's he's still getting calls um i also had a couple calls earlier uh in the fall but um i i guess yeah he he thought it would be a good idea for me to at least touch again on <laughs> varroa management i know this is something that i repeat um over and over every time i'm here and and uh john repeats too but uh you know just stressing the importance of uh, monitoring early in the fall, like as soon as your honey supers are coming off, take some samples, uh, see what your mite levels are. If, if they're low, uh, you know, right when your honey supers are coming off, a lot of those mites are still going to be in the brood. So you may still have lower levels. So you, if they're low, low that, that you, you're not going to make treatment decisions right away, check again keep checking uh into the fall um and then you know you can really make some some uh educated decisions on what treatments uh, you're going to be using um earlier on you know if, if you if you find you have high mite levels early on and you know uh, the the earlier you can make these decisions your your treatment decisions are just going to be uh um, you know, so much greater. You have basically all the options are open at that time. If you're, you know, early in September, you can put Apivar in or, or one of the other uh, strips with, with a longer treatment duration. Um, but, you know, getting to this point in the season, as John mentioned, uh, you really are, are, your treatment options are severely limited at this point. Uh, really, like right now, you're probably limited to oxalic acid, like John said. Formic acid, maybe, uh, like next week is still kind of in the mid-teen uh, uh, temperature range. So you may still get some efficacy with something like formic acid, but, you know, the, the bottom limit to formic is 10 degrees. So that treatment's still going to be uh, uh, quite limited at this point in time. Uh, another really important thing is, you know, monitor before, make your treatment decisions, but monitor again after the treatment is in. So you know that that treatment has worked. Um, and maybe this is a good time to mention too, uh, that, you know, Rael and I have been doing some, uh, uh Amitraz or Apivar resistance testing this fall. And, and we have seen, uh, in one case, uh, signs of Apivar not working, uh, as well. And this, this was in an operation where this beekeeper has really been relying heavily on repeated applications of Apivar spring and fall and, and just really relying on Amitraz as a treatment. And, uh, you know, that's, that can lead to problems. And, um, you know, it's really important to be switching up these treatments and rotating, you know, probably don't treat twice a year with Apivar. If you treated with Apivar in the spring, pick something else uh, in the fall to bring those mite levels down going into winter. Um, so that's really important because, um, you know, if Apivar uh, is losing efficacy, you know, it can really uh, hurt your operation, but it can hurt 
other operations, uh, you know, if those mites are spreading from to your neighbors. So, um, you know, just just be be uh, uh, diligent with with the way that you're using these uh, treatments. Um, so, you know, I, I did put together a, a Google Doc earlier in the season with uh, just kind of um, a whole slew of, of different links to different Varroa resources. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share that in the chat again so you guys can uh, take a look at some of these Varroa resources. Probably a lot of these you've already seen. Uh, I did just add a new one. There was a new document uh, put out by the Honeybee Health Coalition um, down in the States. Um, so that one I just added a few days ago. So you can have a look at that as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much all I wanted to say and, and you know try not to uh, get caught off guard you may you may think that your mite levels are low but uh, they might surprise you if, if you uh, go and take an alcohol wash um, and some hives can be higher than others too so try to take uh, you know at, as broad of a sample uh, throughout your apiary as you can excellent so I think I'll leave it at that Oh, I appreciate unless, that. I appreciate unless there's any that, questions. Man. Anyone have any questions for uh, Derek? Uh, raise your hand and unmute your mic because we're not going to hear you. I guess, yeah, one other thing I wanted to point out is that um, Rael and I have been doing these, these uh, apivar resistant tests and this might be something like these tests are actually fairly easy to set up. And, you know, if, if the Red River Apris Association would like something like a, a workshop put on of how to do some of these uh, resistance tests, um, I'd be happy to um, do that over the winter or, or in the spring or whenever, um, just to uh, uh, teach, teach beekeepers how to do it. And, you know, you could screen your colonies on your own uh, before coming to the care TP, uh, if, and then, you know, if you're noticing a problem, then we can follow up with some more testing for you. Uh, Marg, you have a question? Um, yeah, I, it, it's just a note of clarification. Um, what other, what other ones, treatments for mites are like Apivar that you shouldn't be using? Like right now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like the, the other strip treatments like Apistan or Baverol or, or Check Mite. Uh, these are, you know, treatments with a really long treatment window, like the 42-day treatment window. Uh, okay. So putting those into your colony right now, you know, that's taking you into almost December at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, don't leave those treatments in your hives over winter. Because uh, that's another way that resistance can form. Um, you know, I've talked to beekeepers this spring that left their treatments in all winter, and don't do that. Yeah. And, and and those those strip treatments too. You know, they they do need some warmer temperatures. The bees need to be moving around and rubbing up against those strips, and and you know, spreading that that active ingredient throughout the colony as well. So uh, those you know, if you put some of those treatments in now, they're going to be much less effective than they would if you put them in beginning September. Okay. Thank you. Dave, did yeah. you have a question? Uh, yeah, it's just for axillic acid vapor. Um, just a question on the, how the mites react to the vapor, how quickly the mites will drop. I know if you treat the hive and then put a sticky board or a file card in there, What's the timeline when a mite is considered to drop? Is, is it 24 hours, is it an hour? What are you looking at? If you know you got mites in there and you're expecting them to drop, I guess the window of drop, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, it's pretty quick. It's, you know, within the first day or two, uh, an hour is probably a bit early. Um, but yeah, I was just uh, watching a video the other day of a researcher down in Florida and he put uh, sticky boards in for three days after treatment and, and found obviously huge mite drops within the first three days and then put 
sticky boards in again after that three days and and there was virtually no mite drop so you know with oxalic acid you're going to get all those you know the kill is is basically right away um maybe not within the first hour but definitely within the first couple days so 24 hours is probably a pretty good window to watch yeah yeah definitely watch within 24 hours and and there'll probably be some more kill uh after that okay thank you I don't think some people really appreciate the, how useful uh, screen bottom boards and fresh sticky pages are. Uh, like in for monitoring for mites and knowing when that treatment was effective or wasn't very effective, especially if you're dealing with formic acid treatments and you've got weather that suddenly isn't cooperative with you, it's, um, it, it's almost pretty essential. And again, people have this great faith in their treatment. I treated for mites. Mites don't care. Sometimes your maybe your formic acid was was old. Maybe the temperature wasn't cooperative. Maybe you screwed up the dosage. Maybe you just had some really tough mites or a whole heck of a lot of them. The point is, is the keys in, in all of those statements is I don't know. You don't know. You have to monitor. You have to check you have to know where your mites are all through the season as much as you possibly can. No, no one likes lifting off four honey supers to go checking for mites. But if you knew right before the honey flow, you might be able to eke through that window. But absolutely, as soon as you take those honey supers off, you should know. The problem is, is when you turn around and you find eight, nine, 10% mites, like, like, oh my God, kind of levels of mites, you can kill them all tomorrow. Damage done. You're you're you've got a huge virus vector now in that colony, which is what, that's going to last a year. It's going to be kind of compromised. You have to be on top of your mites. And even now, people have faith in the treatments. But if everyone in this room was honest, knowing and we went through it, what are your mites at right now? There's a lot of people that wouldn't be able to answer that question. And it mystifies me that you put all of this hard work and a lot of money into putting bees into the winter and you just sort of at the very last month, you roll those dice and see, ah, oh, it should work out. Well, every local Manitoba queen breeder and nuke sellers love you because you make up a lot of the purchasing of nukes if you aren't going to do that little extra monitoring step to get them through the winter. So there's our daily or our monthly Red River Apries Association be on top of your mites rant and uh, <laughs> we'll close it off with that. But really, if you take care of your bees, your honey does take care of itself. So keep that in mind. Uh, moving on to some club business um, is John Spears with us today. I didn't see his uh, John, John is not with us. Uh, he called me half an hour before the report or mm -hmm. the meeting. He asked me to give a quick report. Go ahead. He basically mentions that the account currently has 9,580 and 41 cents. And there's about $1,849 of, um, of checks that need to be cashed that we have uh, issued out. I think one of them... Derek, you may want to take care of that item. Uh, and one of our speakers didn't cash. So those are items that we're waiting for it to be cashed out. Okay. Uh, um, there's 180 members currently. So that's a good sign. And of course, uh, the end of the year is coming and we'll be uh, looking for new renewals. So we encourage everybody to uh, begin that process. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'd like to call on Mark Smith for a MBA report. I know you published one, but if you want to give a quick synopsis, now is your opportunity. You'll need to unmute, please, Mark. No problem. We'll Sorry. All we all do it. Okay. Um... As Ian had said, uh, there hadn't been a huge amount uh, happening um, 
um, but we will be having a meeting very soon. Uh, one of the things that I had left kind of hanging at the end of last uh, the meeting was that um, uh, the whole issue of the drought relief and uh, we made a, a unanimous decision on, at the board level that um, we would, the MBA board, that we would not be applying for that as uh, it seemed that Things, things were a lot better than we than everybody had kind of thought they were going to be. There will be a meeting uh, with the MBA and the uh, Department of Agriculture. And uh, in the newsletter, there is a list of various different items that will be um, uh, discussed. Okay. Ian, anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, just a quick note, uh, just to thank uh, the Red River Apers Association for the donation to the KRTP. I think the amount was $1,200. Um, and I'm pretty sure Nadine, maybe she hasn't cashed that yet, but cash is king to this program because we can leverage it. Uh, so we'll be able to take that money and, and flip it a couple times there. So uh, thanks for that. I just like to say thanks for that as well. I don't know if I've said that yet. <laughs> no, you guys are very welcome. We hope to uh, continue supporting and increase support down the road. We've got some fundraising um, ideas in the oven as well, so uh, we'll look into those into those next year. Um, part of the challenges with COVID and because we are sort of cresting on this fourth wave is meeting in person is isn't very practical and of course things like our loony draws and our big huge prize draws are sort of put on hold um the target really is to meet in person in january um november would be nice but i mean it's just too soon to say and december we don't have meetings regardless so um that is the new target date tentatively for for physical meetings um, also, before we move on, I just wanted to make a note of an article that we had in the Bee Cause over beekeepers and the use of essential oils in our industry. I just want to stress that um, in a lot of that article, some of it is um, practical advice, but when it comes down to uh, using essential oils for uh, varroa treatment, especially when it comes to grease patties, never trust any one treatment and as well monitor your mites and although everyone wants to treat as holistically as possible and keep their melts mites <laughs> dead and their bees healthy and there's this oh harsh chemicals are bad for the bees um yeah they are but keep in mind is that make sure in a lot of cases the cure is 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 worse than the problem even if it if it does beat the bees up a little bit as well. So if you are going to turn around and say, I'm never going to use um, Apistan or, or, or any kind of miticide again, I'm going to go with these strict holistic methods. Um, although it's not wrong to have that tool in your toolbox, do keep in mind that sometimes you don't need a tiny screwdriver. You need a large, heavy crescent wrench. And... Uh, you have to be, I know um, even um, oxalic acid as a main mite preventer has its, has its pitfalls because sometimes it just is, it gets overwhelmed. Just keep in mind that it's not a bad thing to have for maybe doing prophylactic treatments, but please never rely on any one treatment to save you. Keep your eye on your mites and that will tell you what's the best tool to use. Um, were there any other reports from the floor or anyone else had any announcements that they would like to make uh, before we move on to the next stage of our program? Minutes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, all right. Um, time for the show of hands. Uh, the, did everyone receive your emailed copy of the October edition of the B Cause? And if so... Did you raise, <clears throat> did you read the minutes? 
if you um, did not see any errors or omissions, uh, I would like to move or get a motion from the floor to approve those minutes. Hands down, everybody. Can I get a motion from the floor to approve those minutes as accurate? Yeah, I'll make that uh, motion. There's a few little typos, but it's not significant. So I'll make that motion that we approve it. Can I get a second from the floor? Motion by Jim Campbell. A second from the floor? I'll second it. Keith Bamford seconds. I need a raise of hands to approve the minutes. We have 52 participants, so I need 27, please. Twenty-two. Do I hear twenty-four? Okay, we're at. Come on, twenty-six. We need a little bit more enthusiasm. Well, you had that applause, so uh, <laughs> you know. You know, I'll I'll, I'll take the <laughs> I'll applause. Take, I'll take I'll applause. applause. <laughs> okay, we're at thirty participants. Uh, by uh, motion majority, the minutes are approved and passed into record. Thank you very much, Keith and Jim, for the motions. Everyone can lower their hands. All right. Um, I would like to turn it now over to Tim Kennedy, who will be sort of doing a framework discussion on what you are finding in your hives. This is an open discussion um, for, for the members to see what they're seeing on their last check, finding frames of brood, or no brood, or packed with honey, or how they stored up. What are you seeing in regards for pollen and also queen rights? There's been some instances of uh, some um, disappearing queens as well. So Tim, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Thanks, John. Uh, just before we go into that, I was just gonna mention uh, that uh, we have our next speaker potentially lined up for November. And I'll just have Keith, if he's uh, available, to just give us a quick synopsis of who that may be. And we may want to promote that to all our other contacts. Keith? Yeah, I think it's, it is it is a, a it, we've got him tentatively booked. He's agreed to speak it. Sorry there. Uh, we've, we've tentatively booked uh, Medhat Nasser to speak uh, on November 8th. And, uh, we actually haven't nailed down a topic yet, but uh, he's very interested in speaking to our group. And he is a, a I guess I should say, he's a retired uh, provincial apiarist from Alberta. He spent quite a few years there and I think is doing some other contract work now as, as well, even since his retirement. He's presented at many places. He's a, a great speaker with a vast uh, array of knowledge. And I think it doesn't matter what he speaks on, he'll, he'll provide some great scientific information. So I think we should really look forward to, to our speaker next month. Thank you, Keith. Excellent. So if anybody has any question, we'll have more information on that and the newsletter or before that. Uh, so our next uh, little session that we have here, what are you finding in your hives? That kind of came out of uh, a series of questions from some of the uh, the beekeepers that I've been mentoring and also from some emails and texts that have come to me throughout the, the last few weeks. And uh, so I want that to be an open discussion here. <clears throat> so there's no experts, there's no uh, right or wrong answers, except for could you share with us what you're finding in your hives? And, and if someone can maybe give us a little bit of a an answer to that if we're looking for answers to a question. So I'm going to open it up to the floor and you can be a professional, commercial, or you could be a hobbyist like myself. But what are you finding? I'll be picking on you if you don't answer. <laughs> yeah, we will drag you out into the light. So you might as well. <laughs> uh, Ron, you've got your hand up. I do. Can you hear me? We can, we, hear you. we can hear you. Okay, um, I'm brand new to this. Um, we have, uh, uh, my daughter and I are doing this and we have uh, two hives. Um, and um, one of the hives um, right now, I, I did another check today. Um, 
we, we can't find that queen to save our soul. Um, but we've got lots of brood. Um, today I noticed there was still a little bit of larva. Um, neither one of us have been able to see an egg yet. Uh, <laughs> but the, the comment on what I'm seeing on this hive is that the newer bees... They're, they seem to be a little darker. They're not the bright orange or bright yellow striped and stuff. They seem to be a little darker. They're not, they're definitely not drones. Um, they've still got the, the nice stripes and stuff, but I don't know if that's unusual or if it's because it's a new queen that's in there. Um, it's not the original queen we started off with in the, in the, in the spring. We lost, uh, we had a swarm on that one. So, but I just find that their, their back ends and their bodies are darker. And I don't know if that's a, a problem or, but like, I've got lots of brood. They've been packed. There's lots of pollen. Um, they've got storage for, of honey that they've, they've got ready for the winter and stuff. Um, they've been taking in the feed nicely. Um, so I'll just leave it at, uh, that's the, that's different. The other, the other hive we have, they're, going doing well and uh the bees like seem to be brighter color that's all ron how many uh frames of brood do you have in that uh right this morning i probably have uh probably five maybe six frames that have all oh, better than half brood in them okay anybody would like to comment on that Yeah, I could comment a little bit on that. Um, typically this time of year, I don't like going down into my nests because there's not a lot we can actually do. Uh, the hives are setting themselves up and you have to appreciate the nest is um, setting themselves up for winter. So we typically don't see a lot of brood. The, the queen shut down and just our act of feeding, we kind of restrict and backfill that nest off and drift them off into winter. So generally we don't see a lot, but you're seeing six or so frames of brood and then you're seeing a change in, in just the color of the hive. I would suspect that maybe that colony has gone through a queen replacement and you may be just seeing diff different genes expressing itself uh, through the new bees. I'll, I will find that uh, later seasoned, like I'm finding a, quite a few of my hives this fall seems to have uh, replaced the, the queens later in the season for some reason and a lot of them seem to be doing it successfully so that's good but those queens are going to have lots of piss and vinegar in them and they're going to push out and they're going to try to develop that nest make up a little bit of time that they've lost as a you know they've they've missed that first little bit of opportunity to set up their winter nest now they got to establish it and this this has been a terrific fall for late queen establishments because there's lots of pollen out there still coming in and you're giving them food and such so you, what you're probably seeing is a queen replacement i'd put my money on that mm -hmm. which is a good thing and a little bit of brood going on in there just setting themselves up real nice so i'll just make sure are you in one box or two boxes and we're in one box yeah, I'll just make sure that as that brood nest does finally start to shrink down, that you make sure you follow up with some syrup and make sure they have enough feed to get them through winter. That'd be the only concern I have with seeing that much brood in there. Also watch for Varroa mite uh, because uh, you had a break earlier. Have you done any treatments? Oh, no treatments. I did, I did a check a couple of weeks ago and only had one mite. Okay, so you're in pretty good shape then. <clears throat> you won't have to worry too much about that. You could do an oxalic acid vapor just to, you know, make yourself feel good. But uh, <laughs> for, <laughs> for the most part, <clears throat> I think things sound pretty good. Just got to make sure they have enough feed in there. But don't. It, I know it's hard. It's, it's really good. I will never tell someone not to go down into a honeybee nest because you have to get down there to figure out what's going on. Even this time of year, it's kind of foreign to me. But uh, this time of year, if you can help yourself at all, just try to stay out of there. You couldn't find the queen, you risk killing her. And there's no real, because there's lots of honey and lots of bees and everything gets mashed up, you know. So you, she's probably on the side wall, but, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, she, she could be hiding on you. I wondered if it was a different strand of bee, like you're suggesting. So that's kind of what I was hoping for. And, you know, and just praying that it's not a bunch of worker bees laying, you know but I don't see those signs. No, you'd see that in the brood nest too. Like you'll probably see a nice 
your brood frames are good, right? Or are they, yeah. no, you, you, know what a, you know what a drone layer looks like? Yes. yes. Yeah. They're, okay. they're, 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 it's, a, it's a rounder bump. Yeah, that's right. So if you're not seeing that, then you're laughing here. In the no, races, we're not seeing that. Oh, well, super. Yeah. Thanks for your help or, yeah. or your comments. Appreciate it. Excellent. Good. Anybody else? Warner, are you here? I think I saw you here somewhere. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Warner. What did you uh, What did you discover in, in some of your uh, hives there this this late season? That there was uh, very little brood, and they were getting set up for uh, just filling up for the backstock, just filling everything up, and I did get a bunch of pollen. I saw a bunch of pollen in there too, but I'm still uh, curious uh, to see what other people's opinions are on uh, my issue with that weak hive, and I may have to combine it with the queens. And you suggested a possible queen reducer in there? I mean, a uh, uh, queen excluder. Okay. Uh yeah, Warner, you want to ex uh, explain a little bit your situation that you that you had there? Um, I got visited by a bear, uh, and uh, he visited the same colony twice, twice, and he left my other colony alone. And um, I thought I would have lost the queen, but when I put the colony back together again, um, with very little food or anything like that. I've been uh, feeding them. And uh, a week later, I found out that I had a queen there, but I'm afraid I don't have enough, um, uh, the bees don't have enough um, supplies to last for the winter and, uh, and uh, the numbers, but my, all, my other colony beside it does. So I was, thinking about merging it, but the issue is two queens. Okay, anybody here have a suggestion with uh, one very weak hive with a good queen and the other one very strong with a good queen? How oh, weak are you? It's, it's Gary. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Go ahead, Gary. Um, I've... Uh, did I understand him to say that he's concerned about enough food for the winter for the weaker hive? Because obviously I, well, maybe not obviously, but I think that given my situation, I, I may uh, have some frames that he could have with, with honey in them. The honey that I, I can't eat, the honey that I can't eat. Yeah, I, I don't have enough bees for them to cluster properly, it's it's very weak. I have maybe three frames, maybe three three and a half frames of bees. I wintered less than that. Yeah, that's that's a new. So we, and uh, what you can do is to put it in a nuke box. Do you do you yeah. have a nuke box? Uh, no, I was thinking about you putting um, a 10 frame, but uh, taking some frames out and putting styrofoam in there to make it into a small five frame. That'll work. Yeah, that would work. Or smaller. I, I went through three frames um, um, indoors. Uh, so you could, you know, stick it in a back corner of a garage or something, perhaps. Okay, so... Um, we, we wouldn't uh, suggest trying to combine them at all, either with a sheet of paper or anything like that. But you've got the queen. So the hormones. Pardon? Is, the, is the, the one strong hive, is it really, really strong? Um, it's not super strong. It's not as strong as my other two hives somewhere else because it has been... Uh, toppled over and I did lose some of it. I do have uh, like um, a few, um, a fair amount of bees in there. Yeah. 
I'd be more inclined to do something from the the um, you know paper it on to a or, or a, with a queen excluder and paper it on with a, a very strong hive. But uh, Ian would know better than I do. Yeah. I'll just make one comment. Uh, sometimes. If you worry too much about the small colony and rob from a bigger one, then you end up losing both of them. So right. maybe, you know, uh, focus on that small one, maybe try to set it up like Brad said or Mark said to restrict the space into a nuke or something like that. And you can maybe winter it on top of a, another colony to share the heat as it goes up, like keep them separate, but just uh, maybe put them on top or maybe put them in your garage. I don't know, kind of protect them a little bit. I've also wintered small units and one of the keys is a really good queen for good wintering because they will do some winter brooding there. So you might have a chance yet. Yeah, don't give up on them, but I'd be careful how, how much fussing you want to do between colony work like that. Okie dokie. So best thing is uh, keep them separate and uh, condense it. Make it into like a nuke. And insulate it if you're doing it outdoors. Oh, most definitely. I'm, I, I'm using um, yours and uh, Waldemar's technique with uh, insulating boxes. Excellent. Thanks for sharing, Warner. Uh, and any, thank you very much. Anybody else has any discoveries or unusual? Uh, Dom Dominic, yeah, do you, uh, Dominic Pillion, you've got Dominic. your hand up. Yeah, something I found uh, this year that I've never seen before. And uh, I've, I've been doing bees for maybe five years or so. Best success in the last couple of years. Um, open brood. Uh, at the larvae stage, almost ready to go, and it's it was open, and I see lots of that. Um, never seen that before. Never seen deformed and no wings on the bees when I was extracting. So that was an indication, I guess, that I had a high mite. And when I checked after uh, um, taking my supers off, it was very high. The acid wash was like incredible. I did formic acid for two weeks and I still had 27. So my other three had about 27. One was pretty good, uh, about six. So that was pretty good. Uh, so that kind of threw me off. Uh, lots of brood. Everything was very strong. So that's why it didn't dawn on me that I had a mic problem. But the open brood is threw me off. Usually it's closed until they're ready to hatch out. And no, it wasn't like that. Um, so I've been doing oxalic acid for the past, uh, well, since September 25th. That's when I got my equipment anyways. So I'm doing it every five days now. And I think you should be doing it at least uh, for 20 days, right? If I remember right. And uh, the other thing I've noticed, a lot of wasps this year, I guess a lot of people have that problem, which is... Uh, one hive was very low on, on uh, reserves, and I imagine it was being robbed by the wasps. Uh, I was using top feeders and some of them frame feeders. And that one that was low, now I'm using a little bottle at the entrance, the reducer. Um, and that's about it. Oh. If anybody's got an idea when to do the oxalic acid, I thought if you do it towards the end of the day when it's, um, the sun's down, then all the bees are inside. But yesterday I got stung by a couple of bees through my suit. Uh, does it happen? And now my arm is uh, kind of swollen. So it's like, I didn't like that. So maybe I shouldn't do it during the night. Yeah, I'd say I'd say do the oxalic more during the day, and the, the bees are going to be a little more active with the heat of the day and, and moving around, and you know, be able to penetrate that cluster a little better with uh, with the vapor. If you're using a wand, um, lots of smoke, you're messing with the entrance, and that's where the guard bees work. So that's why you're getting stung. All right, anybody else? Oh, Jacob.
Hi, um, I have a <clears throat> one hive uh, uh, up until uh, I'd say about a week ago. Um, there was just so many bees, uh, you know, they were bearding out the front uh, like crazy. Um, but some of them um, I noticed had some unusual white coloring on the wings. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that before or have, have any idea what that is. I'd be interested to know if uh, uh, anybody knows what that is. Did you do an icing sugar wash of any sort? No, I didn't. What about eating and too thick of a syrup? Well, I did use uh, uh, a two to one um, um, mixture. So, you know, that I guess that's pretty heavy syrup and maybe some of it, uh, uh, you're, you're suggesting that maybe some of the, the sugar uh, came out of solution and... Uh, yeah, some, works. if it's not mixed well enough, it could uh, crystallize right on the, on the frames. Okay, thank you. I've had an annual occurrence of a, a white pollen making a sort of a more of a stripe down their back, uh, but you described white on their wings. So that doesn't sound like quite the same thing, but, but I've seen that annually. I don't know exactly what flower it is, but it must be a flower that they have to burrow down inside and they come back looking like little flying skunks. <laughs> no, it wasn't like that at all. It was just... Uh... Just on the periphery of of, uh, of the wings, and it was on, only on about half of them, so I, I'm not sure. But and it was only on the ones that were outside of bearding on the outside of the of the of the hive. So, uh, yeah, Jake, Jacob, are you still feeding right now? Uh, I've finished feeding about a week. Ago. Did you notice? Did you notice a problem while you're feeding? Top feeding? Um, yes. Yeah, I find that. Uh, when you're later on in the year, when they're full and you still have pails on, the bees aren't taking the syrup. Uh, daytime, nighttime, you'll get the pails drip. And the drip just is relentless, just drip, 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 drip into the cluster and it gets on the bees and they can't handle it because their stomachs are full of syrup and their cells are full of syrup and they can't, they can't do anything with it. And I find that these bees will have syrup on them and then they'll evaporate and kind of form little crystals on the bees. And those bees that are covered with sugar will cluster on the outside of the, the hive and they'll just continuously groom themselves to try to get that damn sugar off. And typically it's on their wings. So what you're explaining is exactly an overfeeding issue. So they should have enough for winter then? I would say if they don't have, yeah, if they can't take any more, they probably have, have enough. Yeah. And I spent too much money on syrup. <laughs> well, no, I don't know if you can. Well, it depends. Can't do that. But yeah, they'll use it next year. So don't worry about that. But uh, starving is worse. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Heather? Hi. Okay. I have a couple of questions. Um, when I took in the fall, like probably beginning mid-September, I did the oxal not oxalic acid, formic pro treatment. And then when I retested, I had very low... I, it was quite low going into the treatment, fall treatment, but after treatment, my counts were uh, for all three hives, one per 300, two and three might count. Um, I haven't checked since. I'm wondering, I just assume that, that I wouldn't treat anymore because it was a low count. Would you suggest that I do oxalic acid or do you think I'm okay going into the winter? No, uh, doing a treatment of oxalic acid, um, even if you're completely in the dark where your mites are and it, it's not going to hurt them. Um, it's a little bit of extra insurance, regardless of what I use for my fall treatments. Um, usually just after Halloween, I'll do an oxalic acid vapor and just because, because it's yeah. not a lot of time, it's four cents a, a, a colony and it's not going to be detrimental to the bees. And it just gives them, you know, that little last poke in the mite's eye, um, and a little bit of insurance. So 
um, it, I would suggest, yes, absolutely. Okay. So I don't have, because, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you I mean, even if you did one now and then one later on towards the end of the month, that would be even better. Now you, I take it, you don't have a vaporizer. No, I was, I've got, I was going to do the dribble method. If, uh, I think the weather is going to be quite conducive to that. Okay. This week, like you, of course you have, are you running singles or doubles? I'm doing, I switched to singles this year. All right. Well, you know what? Um, there is the recommended treatment um, that Riel sends out every year. Right. If you don't have it, I can email that to you. I've got it. Yeah. Okay. Just follow that very carefully. Okay. Remember when you're handling oxalic acid, it is, yes. an, it is an acid and take precautions. Um, and yeah, then I would, um, as long as you can open them up and it's not, you know, three degrees and you, mm -hmm. even then you can still do it quickly. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I would, there is no downside. Go ahead. Okay. Go. Yeah. I've got everything, the syringe and everything to do the dribble. So I'll do that. My last question was I had a queen. I had a, not a swarm, but I had lost a queen and they, the, my hive number four um, produced a new queen late, later on. So I'm just finishing up with brood with her. I still have a feeder pail on and I know it's getting late, but the box isn't heavy enough. So can I just keep feeding? Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> They're taking the feed, but the brood is still most of it's hatched out. So they just need to fill it. Well, hey, go ahead, Tim. I was just going to ask Heather, how, how many frames of, of honey do you have on that, in that 10 frame box? Um, well, I was kind of, when I went home, because my hives are two and a half hours away, I was home this weekend and I was going more by weight so I would say that the, I've got two full frames that they need to fill in. Mm -hmm. So am I hearing that you've got at least six to seven frames of honey? Oh, for sure. Yeah, from feeding. Yes. And you found um, a pollen? B bread. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Anybody else can chime in. I think I think you're going to be okay. But okay, uh, and it's not a strong, strong hive. It was a swarm that I had caught, and then it had a queen, lost that queen, and then produced later. On uh, you know, now it's got a new queen for about the last month. So I wouldn't say it's a particularly strong hive. I mean, they're healthy, but maybe that is enough food for them. I would say you're, you know, you're, you're probably around that area okay. of enough food. Nobody knows how long winter is going to be though. And I really don't see any reason to take the feed off, to be okay. honest. Awesome. Um, yeah, the, the weather have... forecast next week is still looking really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that really helps me. Thank you. I'll so because when I go out on the weekend, I'll do the oxalic on my highs, take the feed off. I left feed on for that one hive. So we'll see where it's at then. Thank you. You're welcome, Heather. We have okay. another hand with the hands up and we'll have that as the last uh, participant. Okay. Good. Go ahead, person with the hand up that I think I just took down. My apologies. Yeah, hi. Good evening. Um, I went to uh, move my I have four hive boxes and I was just positioning them for winter time. And I was quite surprised uh, today. I went to move off one of the feeding pails and my hives have been fairly strong. Long. And when I removed one of the feeding pails off today and looked down the hole, um, I basically had no bees left. 
So I lifted the lid and I noticed that there were wasps coming in and out of the entrance and that, and I looked down, took the lid off, looked down and I've got about, I've, I seen the queen and there's about 10 bees and the box is empty. Uh, lots of wasps. So I'm totally shocked because, um, you know, I would say about two weeks ago, they were fine. Um, so I don't know what's happened. Um, any, any, like any suggestions as to what may have happened or now I have a queen and she's got about 10 bees with her. So I guess that box is done or any suggestions I would really appreciate it. Thank well, you. Well, you're, you're, you're kind of right. You're kind of right. I had the same thing happen to me and, um, I basically was 12 hours too late uh, to save this one colony. I, I, th I had shortened the entrance. I closed off the top entrance and I missed an open knot hole and the wasps just were, were, were relentless. By the time I did a rescue, I pulled three frames of brood, a couple of hundred bees and uh, one really scared queen out of that. In your situation, um, if you have a nuke box or even anything smaller to pull that out, you can possibly put the queen up for sale um, because I'm sure there's someone with a decent sized colony and no queen, um, but it's basically a salvage operation at this point. I, there's not enough time left in the beekeeping calendar for you to... Um, to bring that back it's just damage done and it's very unfortunate um wasps have been phenomenally terrible this year and um it's it unfortunately they seem to take a, a percentage you just have to be very vigilant and even if you make all the right choices it can still end up a bit of a tragedy i'm sorry to hear about that does anyone else yeah. have any? Does, it, does so, anyone else have any suggestions? I'm just thank you. Wanna, like, does anyone else have any suggestions for Heather? I really yeah, don't. I, see I'd a like of... to chime in there a little bit. Oh, for sure. Thanks, Waldemar. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, um, that happens in any operation. <clears throat> Since we are actually raising queens that are hibernized, a lot of the genetics are not showing protective uh, behavior anymore. And uh, I would just squish that queen, never sell it. Good riddance of uh, hives that do not behave as, as they're supposed to. They show up on and off, even in bigger operations. People just don't understand why. It's genetic behavior that causes this. You raised okay. actually, so you, raised, you raised two queens in a, in a summer too. There was a different <clears throat> question before. The queen that actually is raised before the June 21st will behave completely different than the queen that actually has been raised after the June 21st. The June 21st, every nose is an equinox. So for the queen that has been raised in, mid in the middle of the summer, it's beginning actually as a spring in June. And so those queens will push a lot harder in the fall time. And that's why you actually can judge already if you have right now five to six frames of brood in a hive, that means actually you have a queen that actually hatched and started laying past June 21st. This is why you have issues of trying to fill in enough food into the hive because they prefer to push still for brood and expand. <clears throat> uh, back to the issue with the food. If you have six frames or seven frames of food in a hive, you should ins inspect that hive and make sure that the cluster that you actually have or the brood nest is not somewhere on a side. It has to be centralized, even if you have, have to physically move everything into the middle. So if they go into the winter, that there will be food on both sides. But uh, yeah. This is basically a genetic problem. I had it over the years too. And I'm always saying, okay, if they don't hack it, good riddance. Because this is not the genetic that you want to have um, 
even spread through the apiary. No, oh, very good, very good point. Very good point. Excellent. Uh, um, okay, we're looking, we're running a little bit behind, but that's that's okay. Um, we're going to shift over to um, our main speaker for the evening. Tim, did you want to do the did you want to do the introductions or should I? Yes, I wanted to do this here. Okay, here we go. Now everybody has met this person. They've seen him running around doing all kinds of things. But I wanted to kind of give you an official little bit of a presentation of who this person really is. Our presenter has had a lifelong passion in beekeeping. He grew up on a farm near Swan River, Manitoba and was introduced to bees and hives from an early age as his own father raised bees and spoke fondly of their characteristics. Being educated in computer technology, he spent much of his life in that sector. It was until his wife, Carol, showed an interest in beekeeping and enrolled in the University of Manitoba Bee Corps studies, later to discover that she would not be able to work with bees that our presenter had renewed, uh, and at that time the presenter had renewed interest fr uh, from a distant past. Now currently he is in his seventh year in keeping bees. From the start he has had an objective on a large uh, and, and an eye on a large operation. As a developing apiarist he currently manages about 150 hives and makes his livelihood solely from beekeeping, if I understand that correctly. Like a, a well-lit smoker, he doesn't let the fire go out. And in these years as an apiarist, he currently operates as an MBA director, has done a short stint as a hive inspector for the province. And you can often see him producing YouTube videos under the identification that bee man at Faith Apiaries. Digging further into what makes this person tick, you will discover a kind, gentle, caring individual with a philosophy such as nothing worthwhile is easy, or you cannot force bees to do what you want. You need to get on board with what they want. Now, some of us may brag about our honey being the world's best honey. However, our guest knows that he indeed has one of the finest honeys in the province. And he knows that once you have tried the rest, you'll be back. So speaking on the topic, my beekeeping journey, please unmute your mic and give Brad Hogg a big welcome. Yay. Hey, good stuff there, Brad. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Tim. Well, I think Tim has pretty much blown up my presentation. So uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, have a good evening. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, Tim. No, that was really uh, that was really something. Um, I am very very new at this presentation thing, and. Uh, I'm going to be reading a lot of it. I've made a lot of notes here. I've got a little slideshow to share. And so I will share screen. I'll share that. Okay. So are you seeing that slide, everybody? Yes. Yeah, okay. coming through. Yeah. Looks good. So I have a presenter window on top, though, and I'm trusting that you're not looking at that, right? You're just looking at the nice, clean slide of the happy beekeeper in his colorful hive. <laughs> well, we That's can... correct. That's correct. OK, well, yeah, my seven-year beekeeping journey. There's going to be a lot of different stuff in here. Uh, not a lot about telling you how to keep bees. You already know that. And who am I to tell you how to keep bees? I'm so new at it. Um, there's some philosophy of life in here, philosophy of business, 
uh, talking about different things that I've tried and different things that I've done. Some things have failed and some things have worked out okay. And it's a real thrill uh, to speak to you today. And uh, it's, it's also a great honor. So I wanna share my personal beekeeping journey into the world of beekeeping and honey production and marketing. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about my past. Tim has already told you a little bit about that, but I'll, I'll put it in my own words and maybe give it a little more detail. Uh, so on to the next slide, if I can figure out. Oh, there we go. There we go. So you can see this slide here. So your task, it's like finding the queen. Uh, your task is to figure out which of those pictures in this collage is actually me. So this collage represents a few of the things I've done in my life. Uh, I was born at a very early age. Uh, I grew up on a grain farm near Swan River, Manitoba. I've lived in Winnipeg. I've lived near Thompson, Manitoba, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver. I've traveled to many, many locations in Canada and US. Uh, I've worked a number of jobs and professions, including pig farmer, commercial cook, commercial driver, warehouse worker, mechanic, teacher, IT professional, uh, and a number of variations upon that theme. Now, I'm probably just about the biggest beekeeper in Manitoba. I just don't have very many bees. What, what I don't have, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell if there's any reaction to these because I can't hear you, I can't see you. Um, so give me a, you know, an applause or something if you feel led. <laughs> thanks, Joe. Oh, thanks, is that Heather? That's Heather. Um, so what I don't have in my past is a long line, a long line of beekeepers. Yes, my father did keep bees at one point in his life. Um, what I do have, uh, what I do have a lot of my past is doing things I don't know how to do. And this is my little slide on that. Um, this is not a, a, a philosophical thing I live by, but it is uh, something I discovered a few years back that kind of characterized what I've noticed as a pattern in my life. Uh, Pablo Picasso is attributed to say, I'm always doing that which I cannot do in order that I may learn how to do it. And in my words, how I say that is, I do not do because I can, but rather I can because I do. And so that's just a little bit of kind of how I approach things. And this is uh, one of the very few things that I have uh, showing my father. Uh, this is a still from an old Super 8 video well, <laughs> movie film, we called it. Uh, and I don't know when this was. Uh, I don't know when my dad kept bees and I don't know how long he kept bees. I don't have very much uh, of a recollection of it. I was very young. Um, but there are a couple of scraps of information here that uh, kind of put things into, maybe into a time frame. This here is my dad's beekeeper certificate, registered a beekeeper in Manitoba, and I have it here. It's, it's right here beside me, actually. And the postmark on the envelope that it uh, was in is November 29, 1971. Now, I don't know if he'll get pinched for this, but I think he was a beekeeper for quite some time before he registered. <laughs> so I'm glad Riel's not here. He might get in trouble. <laughs> My dad's been gone for, for uh, oh, well, 2013, so do the math. Uh, and this is my beekeeper registration that goes beside my dad's. Now, the other piece of information that gives me a little bit of a time frame is my dad took the beekeeping course at U of M in 1966 and uh, I would have been about three months old when he started that course and my certificate is dated exactly 50 years later wow. 
So there's a little bit of trivia there. And I, I'm, I'm so glad I have those documents. Um, you know, 50 years between his beekeeping and mine, it's not like I held them near and dear to my heart for 50 years. They came into my possession later on uh, from my siblings who had them. So on to the, the beekeeping part. Why beekeeping? Uh, when my job ended in 2014, I was feeling burned out in the IT world and I was looking for a change. That fall, my wife decided to take up hobby beekeeping and ordered two packages of bees from BeeMate. Uh, through that winter, she studied a lot. Uh, and after a time, she decided that there was more to this, this quote hobby than she was prepared to take on. And I, and I think a lot of you would kind of attest to that and, and tell her that it's probably good you didn't do it because it's uh, a bit overwhelming and, and uh, all consuming. So I can't blame her for that. Still searching for my way, I asked her about the potential business opportunity with the bees. Through that process, I erroneously arrived at the conclusion that I could make a living at honey production. Of course, I'm half joking about that, uh, but it has been difficult and not really all that profitable. It's difficult to run an operation big enough with one person, especially one person that's getting kind of old. Um, the one thing that really came out of that uh, that benefited me in a huge way was my wife was my first beekeeping mentor. I remember that first summer, um, now that was 2015, and if you remember the date on my certificate, I took the course at U of M the winter after my first summer of beekeeping. So when we got those first packages in April, I knew zero about bees and beekeeping and honey and all that. So she taught me the basics I needed to know. And I'm ever so thankful for that. So these are the, the two packages that uh, were at Bee Made when I arrived on April 12th. And the two nice little hives that I actually built in my wood shop. Look at that. Um, I'm just reading this and some of it I've already talked about, so I'll skip over those parts so I don't bore you. So I've been mentored by who I consider to be some of the most experienced and knowledgeable beekeepers in Manitoba, and even a few from elsewhere. Uh, so in 2016, as mentioned, I took the U of M course. Um, I've also had the pleasure of working for the province of Manitoba as a bee inspector for two seasons, uh, during which time I learned a ton about bees and beekeeping. Uh, I have been a member of Red River Association and the Manitoba Beekeeper Association for most of my time as beekeeper. And I have been a director with the MBA since 2017. And I'm not here to tell you how to do it. In fact, if you ask me a question, I'll, I'll often simply say, I don't know, uh, because there's so much I don't know. If I do give you information about a process or technique, I'll always assume that you'll take that as the start of understanding and mold it to fit into your management style as a means to serve your goals and objectives. Unlike many of you, beekeeping is my full-time job and for much of the year, it really is full-time. Although my generous wife does help me from time to time and I do get some assistance from friends here and there, I operate my, business, my beekeeping business on my own. I currently manage 150 colonies. This task keeps me busy, uh, but I do, emphasize, em, I do empathize with those of you who have jobs besides beekeeping as I know how demanding the bees can be. I have the advantage that I can devote 100% of my time to my business. Uh, to be a sideliner who's got evenings and weekends, I can't imagine doing that. That would just be so overwhelming and frustrating because the bees just have that, have that whip as uh, one of my esteemed mentors often says. Having grown up on a farm, that kind of life was not foreign to me. So that was a fairly smooth transition from a desk job uh, into farming. 
Fortunately, I already had some equipment and infrastructure to help kickstart this venture. I had a small parcel of land, uh, trucks, trailers, a small tractor, buildings, a decent workshop or a wood shop. Uh, even though the capital costs would be challenging for years, having these assets really helped me start beekeeping in earnest. From a beekeeping perspective, I grew my colony count from 11 colonies the first summer, seven packages from Bee Made and four nukes from Scott Creek Honey uh, to my count of 150 today. Now you say I got two packages from Bee Made, not seven, uh, <laughs> because our plans had kind of changed. Uh, when I was picking up my first two packages, I said to Tracy, have never met Tracy before in my life, uh, so you got any spares? And the next day she phoned me and says, yeah, I have five spares. So back to town I went. And uh, so we ended up with seven packages and there they are in all their colorful splendor in my yard. So if you look at this apiary, there's a few comparison pictures here. You look at this apiary uh, from my first, uh, my first summer. And this is kind of what we're looking at today. Uh, there's three yards, the bottom two yards uh, compose 32 each and the top has, the top is my home yard and it gets all of the miscellaneous stuff and the increase. So there's about 85 colonies or so there. And that's a lot in one yard. I have had many successes in my increase, but also many failures and setbacks. In that time, I had two bad winters, which dramatically moderated my ability to grow. I've used a number of strategies to grow. I've made splits with purchased queen cells, splits with purchased mated queens, OTS splits, purchased nukes, made splits with my own grafted queens, etc. I guess you could say the only thing I have never done since my first day of beekeeping is by a package of bees. But I've done just about everything, every other method. <clears throat> and every one has its place. I would not say that one is, a, is an excluded method from uh, how you should grow. So to me, everything is a balancing act. There are a few black and white rules and this doesn't just go for beekeeping. This is, uh, this is life. Wisdom is knowing which side is out of balance and knowing how to bring things back into balance. And now a little bit of practical <clears throat> information here. So my, my basic management process uh, at the beginning 2015 to 2017, I managed doubles. And I think with this application, I can point. Can you see that pointer? So, <clears throat> so after my first year, the 2015 apiary that you saw uh, was, you know, standard single bottom board, standard telescoping cover, etc. cetera. Um, the next year in 2016, I switched to a two-way pallet and, uh, you know, I don't know what you call them, but these, uh, the hives are side by side on one pallet and a migratory cover, but I was still running doubles. Doubles are, uh, I've heard Riel say a number of times, doubles are training wheels. <laughs> and, uh, that's not meant to be a demeaning term at all. Um, but doubles do help you not fall, fall over quite as easily. Uh, if running singles, um, especially I mentioned earlier about, you know, having that day job, having evenings and weekends, um, doubles are a good thing for that really, because singles, you may at certain times of the year, you may not have that luxury of, of saying on Tuesday, well, I'll get to that this weekend and that's not going to be good enough sometimes for singles. So doubles are good that way. In my context, doubles are not uh, there, there are a lot of extra expense and a lot of extra work. If you can imagine, uh, 150 colonies, put that in doubles, it's 150 more boxes, first of all, 1500 more frames. Um, so just do the math on the expense, regardless of any other issue. 
So you can see on this side, uh, singles on the two-way pallets. Then in, uh, and that, that happened in 2017. And 20, so in 2017, 2018, I ran, uh, this is a two queen system uh, with a single or a common honey super stack. And there's a specific reason I did that. For the first few years of beekeeping, I used an IPM strategy to, uh, that's called drone trapping or drone culling, uh, drone removal. So during the honey flow, when these supers start stacking up as they do, I have this small cover on the side here, which gives me access, easy access to the first five frames of that brood, brood chamber. And one of those frames was my drone frame. So I could go in there and of course you need to call your drones every th three weeks or less. And I could go in there and call that drone frame every three weeks without lifting honey supers off. This is a very viable way to run things. The bees get along just fine. They don't tend to cross over though. If this colony is stronger than that one, this side of the super will fill up faster than that side. Uh, there are times when I've actually picked up that super and turned it around just to give the strong colony some more work to do. One of the main reasons that I didn't like that system, other than the fact that I needed a lot of equipment in, in these little lids, is that if one side of this, if one of these colonies uh, has a queen failure, there's enough pheromone from the other side that they won't requeen. So I ended up having more complete colony failures than I really wanted. Uh, I would I would go into these and there would just be practically nothing left, um, you know. In, in a matter of weeks. So I've dropped this system now. Um, I, I, you know, that drone trapping, uh, scientifically speaking, it does have an effect and it is a positive thing for my control. It's not a standalone. And I've been able to, with Apovar and oxalic acid, been able to keep my mites under acceptable control without that strategy in, involved. So this last corner, the bottom right, is just my current setup. And just the only thing I really want to mention about this is you'll notice, you may notice that this is the front of the hives and the hives are facing each other. It's just a little bit of a different uh, way of doing things that I had never seen before. And I firstly did this uh, in the fall uh, to help each, each pallet of, of hives would protect the other one from the wind. And I think that has a, a really good effect. A uh, great side advantage is I have all this space on the side and the back and the other side. I can work bees and I'm nowhere near the entrance. And it's, it's just a, a huge benefit. I, uh, I see other people working bees and I forget about that not everybody does this. And, and you know, they're always having trouble with the bees and everything. And I, I sit here on a super in my shorts and, uh, you know, usually not a problem. Of course, once in a while, you have some trouble. So in the winter, it's not necessarily full time. So I do, I build things. I have a nice wood shop and I build frames and I build I'm not going to say I build boxes because I don't build boxes. So in my notes here, I, I have, I learned early and the hard way that you should never build boxes from scratch. You can buy the parts to build boxes and assemble them if you want, but even that doesn't pay well. And, uh, and the reasons go even far beyond just saving time and effort. And I want to caveat my comments here. I am all for someone wanting to be involved in their beekeeping hobby by building boxes, etc. Uh, and, and that's not 
kind of the, the, the context that I'm giving this presentation. The context is um, my seven years trying to build uh, a, a small beekeeping business, a commercial beekeeping business, hopefully make some money and uh, make it my living. So these are the things that I have to be careful of. I have to make sure that I'm spending my time wisely, uh, staying busy at things that are profitable, not wasting time on things that aren't paying. So this is a, a picture of some, some pallet loads of, uh, these, are, these are migratory covers here that I built. And these are three skids of, of two-way pallets that I built. Uh, so they've come back from the dipper and uh, they're all ready to go brand new. Really nice. So my main reason for not building boxes is that you can pay yourself far more by doing other work uh, than what you would gain by building boxes because you're not gaining anything uh, in, in valuing your time in building boxes. The the, the parts or the boxes assembled and, and dipped are cheap enough that you can't buy material and mill it and put it together and be any farther ahead than you can just buy it off the shelf. Uh, so that's my experience. And, uh, and again, this is a context of trying to use your time profitably. You have to, you know, try to pay yourself. So the same thing goes for frames with a twist. Assembling frames can pay, uh, but it's, it can also be tedious. Uh, you always have to ask yourself, what would I be doing if I wasn't doing this? And often when I'm building frames, I'll look for any reason to do anything else because it is very tedious. Um, I, I typically, I build thousands of frames every winter. And uh, yeah, it's it gets very, very tedious. I mean, this is just, I think this is maybe one day of building frames. So if you can do something else to either save you uh, more money or make you more money, then you should consider either delaying your current activity, rescheduling it for a time when you can't do anything else, or simply outsourcing. Uh, outsourcing can be a powerful tool that allows you to focus on those core activities uh, that are in essence, that are the essence of how your business thrives. There is a hidden benefit, uh, sometimes doing these jobs that you know fine well are not making you a dime will pay off in the future in residuals. So uh, the trick is to know when to speculate on those residuals materializing uh, and even then, there are no guarantees. So residuals, if that's a foreign term to, to some, and, and I'm sure it might be, um, that's, the, that's the value you get from pro bono work. You know, you, you do a good turn and it returns to you later on. Uh, maybe you can, you can give a box of honey to a charity that gets your honey in, in the hands of some of the people they're, they're giving it away to as a prize, for example. And uh, they'll taste your honey and, or just, just really appreciate the fact that you supported that charity. Then they'll phone you up later on and start buying honey. The, a number of times I've had people phone me up and say, you know, I was over at my friend's house and your jar of honey was sitting on the table. So I phoned the number on the back and I wanna come and buy some honey. So those are residuals. So again, it's, it's all balance. There has to be a balance between doing everything yourself and outsourcing everything. Uh, you can't do a superior job at everything. Uh, and if you concentrate on your core business, uh, you can take advantage of the economies of scale. Um, you know, very kind of a simple one is, is working 10 colonies of bees is as easy as working five, really. Uh, but, uh, if you're trying to be everything to every part of your business, you might not have time to work the extra five colonies of bees, and thereby you're missing out on the revenue from those colonies. You cut your revenue by 50%, so you can have time to build boxes, which saves you this much, right? So 
you always have to be wary of, of what's paying and what isn't. On the other hand, if you outsource too much, you'll find yourself either with nothing to do or uh, just doing jobs that either pay you or save you, uh, that neither pay you or save you money. You need to keep busy. You are the most expensive, you are your most expensive employee. You get the best value from your time and energy as you can out, uh, as you can, and you outsource the rest. Even when those jobs that fall on you are not the fun jobs and not the easiest jobs, etc. cetera. Uh, also outsource jobs that you are uh, just plain, yeah, outsource jobs that you're just plain bad at and recognize your limitations while still challenging yourself. So again, there's a balance there. There's, if you say, well, I suck at this, so therefore I'm not gonna do it. Well, you haven't challenged yourself enough to say, you know, let's try this and let's practice at it. Grafting is one really good example. Um, I've, I've spent a couple of summers practicing grafting and, and uh, actually getting pretty good at it. The grafting part, grafting part I'm really good at. But, you know, I'll have somebody come visit and I'm grafting and I'll say, here, try this. And, and it's just like 15 seconds. They say, well, I can't do that. <laughs> it's like, well, you can't play the violin either, can you? So one example that I sometimes struggle with is comb honey. I seem to have gotten pretty good at producing comb honey, but it's a ton of work. And the clientele are a little bit off my mainstream honey customer. The cutting and packing uh, come at a bad time, harvest time, and it's tedious work. I love working with the comb honey. It's so beautiful. And I love seeing customers who buy it. They always, they're always so excited. Um, and, you know, it's always underscored by pulling in $20 a pound for honey is really hard to give up. Uh, this is an area where I always need to revisit the question of which side of which side this falls into. Uh, tough it out and package all that comb or give it up and find a more profitable endeavor. I can always wash feed pails at that time of year, but washing feed pails doesn't pay very well. Sometimes there are opportunities to both save money and make work easier. Uh, this will not hold for everyone, but in my case, the decision to winter bees indoors was an easy one. The decision process had nothing to do with the bees, uh, other than both indoor and outdoor methods are completely viable, but rather had everything to do with me. Again, don't forget, I do this alone. I'm uh, 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 kind of a big old fat guy and, uh, you know, reducing the workload is always welcome. In the fall of 2016, and remember, 2016 was only my second fall, so I wintered outdoors only one winter. I went over the math, both financial and workload-wise. I found that I could only uh, not only save thousands of dollars by not buying winter wraps, but I could also leverage my tractor and two-way pallets and save myself a ton of manual labor in wrapping hives if I just moved them into my old garage for the winter. So that's what I did, and it's been working great ever since. It's a fantastic facility, and uh, the bees have wintered very, very well in there. So attention has to be kept on the main goal, honey production. I will never agree that it's honey production at any cost. I do believe in operating a business in a responsible manner and a manner that has to be either positive or at the very least been, have a benign impact on the world around you. I've never met a beekeeper who keeps bees just for the honey. Uh, beekeepers keep bees for the bees. The honey pay the, pays the bills and buys more bees. And we all need that. Uh, this is not to say that you can't be enthusiastic about your product. If you're not enthusiastic about it, why would your customer be? In my first year, I set a box of bees in my backyard and they produced some rather light and tasty substance that I now call clover and wildflower honey. And this is an example of what I got that first year. 
and I've scarcely got it since. Every year it's a little different, but I don't know that it's ever been quite that light. I didn't know anything about honey. Other beekeepers and customers who really know honey started telling me how special this honey was. Um, it's good that it's uh, special because there isn't a lot of it. Over the past 10 years, so seven years, my bees uh, have produced almost exactly 100 pounds of honey per colony each season. Uh, to many beekeepers, this would be a crop failure. Because of this, I needed to develop an appropriate marketing strategy. I had to find my customer. Doing markets was a, a good bit of market research. I could talk to the customer, get their reactions in real time. I soon learned what they wanted and how they, by how they reacted. I learned who was, uh, who was and who wasn't my customer. And I waste zero time on customers who are obviously not my customer. Again, the wisdom is determining who is your customer. Networking is important for all successful business owners. Get with like-minded beekeepers. Socialize with them, work with them. I'm sure that everyone here would attest that Red River Association is uh, an invaluable resource for networking uh, with other beekeepers. And not only beekeepers, but people from all walks of life. If you need a mechanic or a plumber or a lawyer, there's probably one in the group. <clears throat> In 2017, I was drafted by the Manitoba Beekeepers Association Board. And all in all, I've benefited immensely from the contacts and camaraderie uh, that I've enjoyed there. Not only that benefit, but the opportunity to see the wheels turning inside the machine is fascinating. Even if I sometimes feel like I'm not contributing, uh, I'm told that I am, thankfully. Uh, this being said, John, I'm still not join, agreeing to be on the Red River Association board. Well, hold on there, Brad. <laughs> Is it because John, you're that... breaking up. You're breaking up, John. <laughs> I'm just, just going to ask uh, all of your cohorts how they actually convinced you to join their board, and I'm just going to duplicate the method. So, <laughs> well, uh, I'll have to tell you about that sometime. It's not a story for a mixed company. <laughs> I have no doubt. Uh, so I have a few slides here um, and there's no nice pictures to look at, but they are axioms. I call them axioms and maybe that's a little bit too bold, but uh, they are uh, things that I find are truisms about beekeeping and about life. Number one is listen more than you talk. You have two ears and one mouth for a reason. I remember when I started beekeeping, one of my favorite things, meet a new beekeeper. You, you go out and talk to, you go out and talk to Murray Lewis, for example, a great guy to talk to. I love that man. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of like you go to one of those beekeepers and you just sort of, you wind them up and you just let them sit there and talk about bees. Uh, resist the temptation to stand there and tell this seasoned beekeeper all of the trivia that you've learned about bees in the last week right i know you're excited and i know you're you love the you know the nuances of the waggle dance or or you know things about honey being heated to whatever temperature they don't need to know that because they know all that kind of stuff uh, what you need to know is what they know so let them talk Seek advice to those who share your goals and objectives. Rightly so, people will usually guide you to where they want to be rather than where you want to be. And of course, that's because that's where their focus is. That's where their expertise is. Uh, you know, it's not a, a narcissistic thing or anything like that. It's just simply, uh, you know, where we're at. We can speak from our experience and, and you need to speak to people who have the experience that you want. Uh, to have. Always listen to contrary opinions, however. And again, that's the balance. Don't, don't become a, a cult follower. <laughs> There's a lot of cult leaders around and uh, don't become one of those because you need that dissenting voice. You need that uh, opposing viewpoint in your, your arsenal to develop your own methods and your own, your own education. 
A smart man learns from his mistakes and a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. So again, watch, listen, learn. That's probably my favorite uh, axiom uh, for life. And again, in life, give more than you get. Help others grow in beekeeping as well as other parts of life. This is a beekeeping axiom. Bee, bee escapes and upper entrances are not a good combination. And I learned this for a fact one day in my first year of beekeeping. Um, as a lot of new beekeepers do, uh, as a lot of, a lot of beekeepers do, period, uh, I was using upper entrances in my hives. The bees loved them. They used them a lot. They would almost use them more than the lowers. Well, as I progressed and I needed to ha uh, harvest my honey, I decided, hey, these bee escapes look good. Let's use those. So I dutifully hauled all of those big deeps, three and four deeps off of all those colonies, uh, put on my bee escapes and hauled all those heavy deeps back on. I remember one day I got tired of taking all those boxes off. My niece was working with me. She was visiting. She was working with me. And I said, you grab that bee escape. I'm going to give these three full deep honey supers a bear hug and lift them all up at one time and you put that bee escape under it and she did it and I think I did that twice and I said I'm not doing that anymore <laughs> that's, a, that's about 175 pounds <laughs> so back to the the uh, the upper entrance thing um, the next day I happened to be walking past the apiary. I was not going to work bees that day, nor the following. And I noticed there's a bunch of commotion going on uh, at the top of some of my hives. And so I, I went over to check what's going on over here. And well, well, you know, what's going on three or four deeps of unprotected honey. That's what was going on. So I recognized, I rectified that problem pretty quick and it didn't become a, a catastrophe. If I'd left that three days, there wouldn't have been much left in those honey supers. So actually, Tim mentioned this one. Nothing worthwhile is easy. I believe that. Um, and, and, and that's because if, if what you're doing is easy, I don't think you're challenging yourself enough. Um, you know, you have to challenge yourself to the outside of your bounds of, of being able to do something because because the things that you can do always, always mold to be outside of the things that you've done. So even if you're no good at them, right? You, you try things, you challenge yourself and you do things that you don't know how to do. And then outside of that is more stuff that you can take a crack at. You get to decide then too. I don't want to do that. Maybe I'm good at it, but I don't want to do it. I'm a pretty darn good cook. I just don't want to do it for a living. Failure. Don't get down about failure. Learn from it. Failure is not the opposite of success, but it is part of success. If you're not failing, again, you're not trying hard enough. You're not pushing the bounds of what you can do and uh, what you can accomplish. And I mentioned this already, not, not every customer is your customer. <clears throat> when you start marketing your products, if you're selling to everyone, you're selling to no one. If you try to be all things to all people, you won't be anything to anybody. You'll just be another item in the wind. You have to be different. Find something that's unique about, if there's nothing unique about your product, make something unique about yourself. Superior customer service. Superior customer service is a dying art. Uh, so it's not that hard to uh, rise above. It's all about residuals. Making a sale is easy and keeping a customer is what you need. Uh, so again, those, a little bit of pro bono, a little bit of, you know, uh, supporting charities or just giving things away at times. Don't sweat the small stuff. Invest in, in the future residual sales that you could make. There's no loyalty in price. If you can attract a customer on price uh, with a low price, 
uh, that customer will drop you like a hot potato for a lower price. Uh, so they will not be loyal to your product. They will only be lower to, uh, loyal to a low price. It's a very precarious place to be. And in all things, work smarter and not harder. Your daily energy is finite. You need to maximize the impact of every step every day. Um, working two hives or five or 10 or even 20, you can maybe afford to waste a step on every colony. Um, you work 100 and you waste a step on every colony. You, waste, you work 150 and you waste a step on every colony. Those really add up. Over the season, those really add up. You'll be buying more shoes and you'll be seeing your chiropractor more often. <laughs> At least I do. So this is the last one. Please buy domestic when you can. That customer you're expecting to buy your local honey versus the offshore quote honey uh, is the same person who makes the hive tools that cost a little more in the store. And I say that I may not may or may not make it in this business, but if I do make it, it won't I won't make it on the backs of my neighbors. Surround yourself uh, with like-minded people. But again, balance. Also engage regularly with those who have differing viewpoints. If there are three people in business who always agree, two of them should be fired because you've got too, too many people. You need someone who disagrees with you or has a different idea. Uh, run your business like it was 10 times larger than it is today. When it grows, it might not be so painful. Um, if you think you can barely make enough steps to do it this way, then don't do it that way because you can barely do it that way. Do it in a way, take the time to develop a method, a strategy that allows you to uh, do that in a way that doesn't completely wear you out at the end of the day or, or take way too long to do it because you have other work to do as well. Now, so this is officially kind of the end of that part of my presentation, and I don't know, um, I think we want to take a Q&A. I have a few other little slides here that go into uh, more detail in some parts, but maybe I'll ask, uh, ask for Q&A, and, uh, and maybe that'll lead us into uh, presenting a few of these other slides. Look at that, Tim. You yes. said 40 minutes. Yes, you did very well. There, I'm Brett. under 44. That's excellent. Yeah, we will uh, move into a question and answers here if, if possible. And and then we'll try to wrap it up around uh, 935, 940 at the latest. I just need you to stop sharing the screen there, uh, um, uh, Brad. If you sure. Could. If, just... if in answering the questions, I can illustrate with some of my ancillary slides. I don't even know what that word means. It just sounds right. Um, then I'll want to share again, but I can stop sharing. No, I just, um, just to see if people have their hands raised, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I guess we'll start with, does anyone have any questions for Brad? The most concise um, presentation left everyone so completely informed. There's gotta I think they're all asleep. <laughs> By the way, that is what ancillary means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave, Dave, can you can you unmute your mic and uh, ask your question? Hey, Dave. Yeah, hey, Brad. Yeah, excellent presentation. Really Thanks, enjoyed man. it. Um, some really good insight and how to develop your operation into expansion and i really like the idea the way you said always plan to be bigger than where you are today mm -hmm. and look for processes to eliminate that i guess the biggest struggle is is honey house for me is certification expansion how do you look at that stuff have you explored that what's your thoughts on that i'm not sure i can help you much because i think i struggle with all of those things just the same way you do. 
I have a I have a handicap because I'm kind of old and I don't have the time to pay off a big loan for a nice honey house. And so you can imagine, <laughs> yeah, so we're kind of battling the same issue. So you can imagine that that, that just kind of complicates everything down the line. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not an easy, there's no, I, I have no easy answer for that. It's, it's do your best. Like, yeah, I don't know what I can say. Yeah, no, I, that, that's, that's the same situation I'm in. I mean, yeah. it's, it's the point of investment and, and yeah. infrastructure and yeah, no, I hear you. Now on, on one hand, and, and I see he's got his hand up uh, and, but I was going to say on one hand, you know, investing in beekeeping equipment, the building might may or may not pay off, but equipment really holds a resale value. I know. So, you know, that's a plus. Yes. Yes. And so, it's hard to find used. Good. Yeah. News. yeah. Ian. Yes. Uh, great presentation, Brad. I really enjoyed that. And Thanks, I've buddy. known you for quite a while. Um, and I'm going to ask you a loaded You question. were my mentor for like a year and a half before you knew it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about you here. <laughs> um, you talked about outsourcing. Yeah. And you talked a lot about balance and that re resonates with me. So I have um, a question to ask you about your dilemma between like outsourcing your queen sources, whereas you buy your queens as compared to producing your own queens. And what is the thought process behind your choice of basically, you know, rearing most of your own stock right now? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think a lot of people are stuck in that uh, that dilemma. My thoughts are, I believe I currently have the energy and time to do my own queen rearing, um, particularly because I have a number of different tools in my toolbox uh, with which to make that happen. Um, currently, I'm mostly using grafting and OTS for my queen rearing and queen replacements. Uh, and that, that Beth is working great, that combination. Um, what I really, really hate about getting into the idea of, of buying all my queens, particularly if I think I need to buy all my queens early in the season and I have to buy them from some far off land, the, these, these issues that you run into have only been really exaggerated in, in the last couple of years with COVID you know, planes can't fly and, and shipments can't go. And, and, you know, and you're standing there, you need how many dozens or hundreds or thousands of Queens? Well, it ain't happening. <laughs> now what? So, you know, when you're outsourcing, yeah, that's a big thing that you need to think about, not just bottom line and not just jobs. I'm not good at or jobs. I don't want to do It's It's, can I trust this supplier? You know, when you start to get a supply chain, uh, I outsource a few things and, and now I'm on the phone. It's like, ah, you know, and then you got to make sure you don't create an emergency because, you know, you need to keep your outsource person happy too. And you can't always be phoning with an emergency because uh, then you get to be not the favorite person on the list. Uh, but yeah, I think I've gotten into a pretty good, uh, pretty good, uh, routine here with with certainly with queens uh so i i think it's you know i would like to see more people do queens i i think you know i i watch you start up your queen uh process and and you know if it's if, particularly if you have a size of operation like your size of operation for example if you even hired one person to do that whole thing that person would pay for themselves easy uh, producing that many queens and then and then you can spin that off into nuke sales and queen sales so uh, to me that's that's just something that I think I think more people should kind of be bold and, and step into to be honest thanks for that question Uh, Brad, I had a question. Yes, sir. Um, in sort of bee security, uh, I'm, I'm a big believer that, you know, if you take your care of your bees, uh, the bees sort of take care of you. Um, you know, some years 
<laughs> more so than others and <laughs> some years you know less um how important do you think is any level of operators queen security important to their success and when i say queen uh, security it's more like the ability to raise your own or to have a surplus of queens uh, i see uh, beekeepers even running at 10, 20, 30 colonies not really getting into queen rearing because of into, either they're intimidated by it or um, it's just something they don't feel they have time for. How big of a difference do you think it makes to your operation the ability to uh, have extra and queens at, on hand at will? John, it changed my life. It absolutely changed my life. 2020 was my first... Um, I mean, I've been doing OTS almost from the beginning. The first couple of years, I didn't do it uh, in in earnest, but I, I, I dabbled, and then I got a routine and and started doing it uh, as part of my my overall strategy. And then I started grafting, uh, and so th so that took care of a lot of my queen needs. You know, requeening, OTS, boom, no question. Uh, like requeening re a colony, they're doing well. They're, they've got a good queen. They're they're performing well, but she's getting old. I want to get a new queen in there. OTS is your deal. So easy, so fast, and so reliable. And the queens that I get out of that process are no kidding, unbelievable. But there's there's a lot of other scenarios need to be taken care of as well. And uh, when I started grafting, and I I had my little. <clears throat> my little mini mating nukes over at the end, the edge of my apiary uh, to be working my bees and to see a situation and, and say, well, I need a new queen. Oh, look, there's a new queen right there. And I just go over a cage or sticker in the hive done Pr problem solved in five minutes to have that supply of Queens sitting there in the wings in the wings you see what i did there bees wings uh, uh so that absolutely changed my and, and coupled with marking my queens uh, when i started marking my queens not just keeping track of the colors but just simply finding that girl in there uh now i can do so many more manipulations in my colonies because i can actually reliably find the queen because she's marked uh, and I've never killed a queen marking her uh, well that I know of maybe she died later on but I mean I've never just squashed one or nothing like that uh, uh, well we all have 600 million drones to practice on that's my theory yeah and I practiced on that that gadget that I use I, I'm not comfortable grabbing them with my fingers so I do use that gadget but I practiced on two drones and it was so unbelievably easy that I went straight to queens uh, and it was, yeah, it was awesome. So does that kind of no, that, that's, cover that, that? That's quite concise. Yeah, life-changing. And again, thanks for the personal, you know, um, presentation of your journey because not a lot of people are willing to, you know, get engaged uh, in discussion on honest and open discussion. And, and I think... Like Tim, I'm, I'm a big believer in everyone sharing their successes, but also their failures as well, because that's how that's how we learn. And yeah. uh, if if anything, in our knowledge transfer, it's not all about experience. It's also about some of our horrific mistakes and how you can avoid them too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thanks again uh, for the time. But yeah. question in chat about what what gadget do I use? <clears throat> it's uh, it's called a one handed queen catcher. Um, it's a man lake product i believe both be made and dancing be here uh carry them uh you're gonna pay you can get on uh i think you can get it on amazon too uh but i will caveat this it's blue do not buy the yellow one the yellow one is kind of a uh knockoff made in china and there's some dimensional differences to it and it doesn't work nearly as well get the man lake one um I think you're going to pay like, I don't know, 25, 30 bucks for it. Um, and uh, I've actually improved it a little bit on, in my side. And I've got, 
I've got anybody who buys one, just email me and I'll, uh, I'll send you uh, my little improvement on it to add to your, your queen, queen catching gadget. Uh, next question, floor is open. Uh, Sheldon, can you unmute your mic? Sheldon. Hey, Brad, how are you doing? Good to see you. Good. I'm going to throw you a little broad spectrum, two-part yeah. question here. Good. If you, if you had to go across the road and get to the side size of operation that you are now, what would you do again, and what would you never do again? Well, I wouldn't leave an upper entrance open with a queen uh, uh, P escape. Uh, what would I not do? Uh, I've I've wasted some money on on gadgets and and things that you know are just stupidity. But I mean, not too much. Of course, there's always those that you can look back and you think, "Geez, I wish I had that hundred bucks back." Um, I had two difficult winters uh, with some fairly high losses. One was much higher than the other. Um, I don't know if I could do a whole lot to have fixed those. I think the second one was a was kind of a a, a result of uh, either damage by Formic Pro or ineffectiveness by Formic Pro, and I've not uh, I've not uh, had the courage to use Formic Pro since. Uh, I, I don't want to diss the product. It's a certified product and it's tested and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, I may have used it wrong. I may have, you know, may have been in, in proper the way I did it or something, but uh, what would I do? What would I do? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think I've, I think I've rolled along pretty fast uh, overall and if I hadn't had those two bad winters, I, I certainly would have reached my 150 to 200 goal, you know, a year or two ago. But boy, you need those failures. You need those failures. The, those failures keep your feet on the ground, you know, because if, if you don't have those failures, then you start flying in the air. And, and, and then, man, when the, wing, when the wind comes out of your sail, you come crashing down harder than anything. So you really need those failures. Uh, they they really make you make you who you are. Uh, keep you humble too. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm never good at answering those. Sorry. Um, what would I do? I I'd, I'd start with about a, an additional hundred thousand dollars, and I'd start twenty years earlier, <laughs> for sure. I hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's the best I can answer that. Thanks for the question. Good. It's supposed to be a quick off the top of your head question. Yeah. But thanks yeah. thanks for sharing that, Brad. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um does anyone else have any other questions for Brad? No other questions. I'm just going to quickly do a, a big thank you, Brad, for uh, this wonderful presentation. I've really appreciated your um, attitude, your your countenance. It's always been a very pleasant and uh, rewarding person. And I'm really very impressed with the work that you've done there. Uh, I have to admit, if no one has ever seen his honey labels uh, on his jar, you should take the time and go buy a case of honey from Brad. At least. <laughs> At least. <laughs> <laughs> Inspect those labels because they're really, they're, they're really very formative, very impressive. And I think we can all learn. In fact, I wanted Brad someday to do a little talk about his marketing uh, genius in regards to the type of labels that he has. <laughs> uh, that'd be pretty short. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't know. <laughs> And uh, we'll be sending you a little bit of an honorarium for your um, for your oh, time. Heavens. We've so all it's completely my pleasure. 
Yeah, I, I, I would suggest that your videos are, are very good. There is one other guy. I don't know who he is. Uh, a guy from South. That, that hobbyist over, I think he's near Miami. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. what a steeper, steeper, stopper, stopper, whatever his name is. Stiper, I think. I don't, I'm not sure. The work that you do, but I think I think you're way out there. Yeah, I you know, I think I kind you know, of surpassed you, his level a, a while ago. So you know, you know, Tim, he was gonna, Tim, he was gonna join like the Red River Executive next year, and now you just blew it. So, um, <laughs> you mean, you mean that stepper guy was gonna join? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a problematic vice president we are trying to get rid of. So. <laughs> uh, no, but you know what? Uh, in, in regards to like YouTube videos, uh, Brad and, and you too as well, Ian, like, you've turned that into such um, an educational resource. And I, I guess for both of you, what I admire most is that if you make a mistake or something horrible is happening, it's not this... <laughs> overproduced piece of beekeeping cotton candy that oh everything's unicorn and rainbows and oh look how easy it is and i'm the master and hey look at me look at me yeah uh, it's like jesus ah, ah! <laughs> and you know the the thing is is when you're trying to relate to people that are getting into it they the, there's this natural insecurity or this feeling that i'm never going to be able to get good enough to accomplish this and you show the side of beekeeping that we all need to learn and some of us the hard way that yeah it's it's there are challenges and but everyone everybody everybody faces those and that realness that you guys in your teaching and your promoting um your your the willingness to share the knowledge and especially get it out there on on social media and promote um really commendable you guys um uh, it it more of us should should be on that it really helps uh the novice beekeepers get comfortable being willing to share their questions and their mistakes and also knowing that there is a a, a realistic path to to being successful in, in a in a, a hobby or a profession that we all love so kudos on you thanks john I like watching Brad on YouTube because he, he keeps in shorts and I'm, I'm just waiting for those bees to crawl up and sting you, but you don't show that part, Brad. I do. I do. That's, I was going to say, that's the Easter egg in my YouTube channel. You have to find the video and the spot in the video where I actually get stung up the shorts on video real time. So there uh, is that video. The, the, the tell is the left eye twitching really. <laughs> 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 It was it was exhilarating. I'll give you that. Exhilarating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if there isn't any other questions, I think we're going to officially shut the meeting down. However, like our Tim Hortons after production parties when we meet physically, um, a lot of us still hang out and just kind of shoot the breeze and talk bees. So um, officially, I'd like to bring the October Red River Priest Association webinar to a close, but do feel free to hang out with, um, uh, with the rest of us. And if you have any questions, especially uh, because this can be a very trying time, especially for novices, feel free to hang out and um, enjoy the banter. John, who's going to move the closure and who's going to second it? I got a motion from the floor to close the meeting. Hey, Marg. I'm going to pick Marg because, you know, Jim already got his shot with the minutes. So Marg will uh, put the motion forth. Can I get a second person? I can second that. Laura, Laura seconds it. Uh, everyone raise their hands <laughs> if they want to call it a night. <laughs> Or transition into the after meeting meeting. Or transition to the after meeting. Otherwise, we're all going to be trapped here forever. So, you know, <laughs> everyone loves an ongoing. We have nine participants out of 44. Oh, come on, everybody. See, this is the problem, Brad. You become a superstar. Now everyone wants it to keep going. 18, 19. Got to have four more. 
There we go. 20. The majority <laughs> rules. Uh, we will close the meeting officially. Thank you very much all for coming. Big thanks to Brad for presenting, uh, sorry, doing the presentation. Um, you know what? Looking forward to seeing you guys um, in November. But feel free again to to hang out and chat bees with the with the rest of us. Um, have a great night and everybody stay safe.